Um, and for our panel discussion, uh, it will feature uh, Dr. Uh, Cynthia Norena, Andrea Miko, uh, both of you, you've now um, heard their introductions and heard from them before, um, and Judy Lacan. Judy had not been, uh, or Dr. Lacan has not been introduced, so let me do that quickly and then we can uh, get into the panel discussion. So Dr. Judy Lekind is president of Lekind Institute, uh, Associates, excuse me, LLC, an adjunct associate professor, Department of Epidemiology and Public Health, University of Maryland School of Medicine. Dr. Lekind is a health and environmental scientist with expertise in exposure science, assessment of human health risks, biomonitoring, scientific and technical analysis for regulatory support, and systematic reviews. Dr. Lekind has spoken and published extensively on exposure and risk-related issues, including children's exposures to environmental chemicals and the presence of environmental chemicals in human milk. Dr. Lekind served as the president of the International Society of Exposure Science and currently serves on the editorial boards of the Journal of Toxicology and Environmental Health and Environment International. Uh, Dr. Lekind received her PhD from the Johns Hopkins uh, University in Geography and Environmental Engineering, her MS from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in Geology, and her BA from the Johns Hopkins University in Earth and Planetary Sciences. So Dr. Lekind, welcome. And uh, I will yield the floor to you if you have any opening reflections as we start the panel. Thanks, um, can you hear me? Yes. So, so thank you so much for the introduction and, and it's really a pleasure to be here at least virtually. I don't know, wherever here is. <laughs> um, yeah, I jotted down some notes as people were talking. And so let me, let me just share a few thoughts. Um, I know this is a, a clinical session, so I should point out that I'm not a clinician, um, but I'd like to share my views as an exposure scientist, but also as someone who could be on the receiving end of intervention advice. And, and also a couple of these thoughts um, come from a review that we did on PFAS interventions that we actually did for this committee. So I think a really important point from my perspective is that when we talk about personal intervention, we're asking people to change their lives in some way in order to reduce their internal levels of PFAS. So I would think that their expectation would be that their levels would be reduced in a measurable and, and meaningful way. And you know we've heard a lot about this today, but it might seem obvious that avoiding exposure to sources of PFAS could result in reduced intake of PFAS, and that in turn could result in lower internal PFAS levels. But you know if that PFAS source contributes a really small portion of overall exposure, then avoidance might not result in an appreciable reduction. So, so it just let me just say something about uh, diet and something about breast milk. So in terms of diet, if there are recommendations to avoid certain foods, and fish has come up a lot today, it's possible that might result in lower intakes. But I think that's only true if we also think through the whole picture. The dietary replacement for that fish also has to have lower levels than the local fish. And so we need to make sure we have enough information so that whatever we're recommending as a replacement actually does have lower PFAS levels than the thing we're saying you know, they should, people should avoid. And as Tom Webster noted earlier, you know, our focus in exposure science for many years now has been on biomonitoring. And I think that's resulted in more minimal databases on environmental concentrations. And I think that's reflected in our lack of data on food in the US. So, we don't actually know that much about PFAS in food in the US. And I think we should be acknowledging the limits of our current knowledge base when it comes to interventions and, and diet. Um, in terms of breast milk, just a quick thought here. I think when we talk about intervention and breast milk, and this has again come up a lot today, there are two questions and I've heard these come up at other town halls. And the first is whether there are interventions that could reduce exposure to the infant and the second is whether lactation could be an effective method, uh, method for reducing the mom's level of PFAS. In terms of the infant, the intervention is gonna be replacing breastfeeding with formula. And if this is gonna result in reduced infant exposure, we better be sure that the water used to either make or reconstitute the formula actually has lower levels than the breast milk. So in the study that we did for, for the committee, we only found a few studies on PFAS and breast milk and only one study on PFAS and formula for this country. And when we compared those levels in the infant foods to levels in tap and bottled water in the US, we found a lot of overlap in concentrations. So in terms of recommendations, 
information is going to be needed on local levels of PFAS in drinking water as well as in breast milk in order to make any recommendations that are going to be well supported. In terms of the moms, and this again has come up a bit, if they want to reduce the levels in their body, there are a few studies looking at um, what's called depuration or removing uh, PFAS from the body by breastfeeding, and the results of these three studies were inconsistent and conflicting. So not a great evidence basis for recommendations. So I think just, just to kind of wrap up, um, what we found in our review for the committee was that it was really only the water filtration studies that provided somewhat consistent evidence, wasn't completely consistent, but somewhat consistent evidence of effective reduction in PFAS exposures. We didn't have any uh, concomitant biomonitoring data to, to back that up. And so in terms of all of the intervention approaches that we looked at, they were mostly not particularly robust, and I would say not robust enough to support recommendations for actually making personal behavioral modifications. We've known about widespread PFAS exposure in blood in the US for over 20 years. And so it's, in my view, really surprising that we don't have this kind of information. Um, I think the only thought I have here, in, and I think one of these at least was raised before, when we talk about recommendations for interventions, we really do need to be considering the ease and cost of the intervention and also the trade-off. If what are we asking people to do something that might reduce their level to PFAS, but increase their exposures to other environmental chemicals. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, Andrea, I wanted to give you an opportunity for some of your reflections. You spoke first and now you've, you've listened to a lot of presentations and discussion and uh, any reflections that you'd like to put forward at this time. Thank you very much. Um, the reflection that I want to give, I, I guess, around breastfeeding and pregnant moms is that there, I don't think there's going to be a cookie cutter answer. And right now there has been. Breast is best, you should breastfeed. I think we need to be looking at individuals. We need to be making blood testing for PFAS avail available to women who are considering being coming pregnant or are pregnant. I think we should be able to access testing women's breast milk for PFAS, if that's something they want to know. The science does show that PFAS does transfer to infants, that the levels are, can be significantly elevated in infants from breastfeeding moms. And I think that's a pathway of exposure that women should absolutely be educated about. They should be counseled on and, um, and be allowed to make an informed decision on what's best for them. Um, I also just want to say in terms of exposures in general, I absolutely see the benefit of reducing exposure. If you live in a community with contaminated drinking water, you should absolutely be filtering your water. Um, if you live in a community with contaminated local wildlife, uh, you should be doing what you can to avoid those exposures. There are clear benefits to reducing exposure to PFAS. And just lastly, that we need to continue to educate our local providers um, to be able to make informed decisions with patients. The reality is we, we face physicians who have never even heard of PFAS or know what they are. And so if we're not making a more um, dedicated effort to outreaching providers, we need to prioritize that. That's a big problem. I know it's hard to do, um, but it's not impossible and we need to make it a priority. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now I see uh, three raised hands, Jane, Kevin, and Aaron. So we'll go in that order. So Jane, uh, please go first. Hey, Sheila, how are you? It's been a long time. Um, so one of the questions that uh, you didn't address is, could bre ability to breastfeed it be an outcome? We know that for other endocrine disruptors that some of them make it difficult to breastfeed. And I don't know if there's any literature on it, but can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. So from the major contamination events with some other chemicals, there, there have been observations that it could be more difficult to breastfeed, you know, less volume production um, and less ability maybe potentially for infants to latch. Um, so actual breastfeeding mechanics, but there hasn't been much evidence on some of these um, other exposures, meaning non-contamination um, you know, general population exposures. And I specifically haven't seen anything for the PFAS chemicals, but um, I certainly haven't done an extensive literature search. So if others know better, I'm happy to hear. 
And good to see you, Jane. Jane was one of my first mentors when I was a fellow. Great, thank you. So Kevin? Yeah, thanks so much, um, Dr. Safdie and Ariana. I really appreciated your presentation. And I was curious, in terms of some of your suggestions, in terms of breastfeeding generally being best, and um, in terms of, you know, it's impossible to get to zero exposure, um, would you want to draw any distinctions between giving advice to those in communities that um, you know there's a good deal of contamination versus, say, the general population? Um, I just wondered, you know, how to approach some of these cases where there might be severe contamination, higher PFAS levels versus others. I wondered what you would suggest. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, and I, I think that some of the points that Judy um, just made kind of relate here as well. So there is a really big distinction. So some of those big picture points of, um, you know, eat fresh foods and take your shoes off, you know, I would give those to the general population. Um, some of the other finer points, um, I would certainly give to the an exposed population. And just, I think most people here know, but you know, overall, what we do with an exposed population is we go through a risk assessment. Um, uh, we go through a, whole, a full risk assessment with the public health officials on the ground, and then we together come up with recommendations that we think would be best for that community. So it really is a different kind of um, guidance um, and certainly recommendations that may happen on the individual level, um, just like Andrea said, that, you know, there may be individuals who have much higher exposures and may need more testing and more intervention um, and closer follow-up. Um, and so we ask to, to hear from those individuals when we're at those town halls or when we're in the community. So definitely different guidance and a different approach. And thanks for making that reference to Andrea. I guess I should have um, asked my question to any of the panelists if they wanted to comment. <laughs> I think if I could just jump in for a second, I think it's worth remembering that the epidemiology literature on PCBs and dioxins in breast milk and children's health outcomes took, you know, it's, it's been under development for about 40 years. Mm -hmm. And even now, while that literature points to um, the, the recommendation to continue breastfeeding in the presence of those chemicals, um, that was, that was 40 years worth of, of literature development. And so it's not surprising if studies haven't begun yet or if they're only just beginning that we don't have information yet and we may not for years. So I, I, I would recommend that you don't wait to have the, the perfect epidemiology study because you're not probably not going to. And that um, I, I think the points made about separating out the communities by highly exposed versus what well, I'm gonna use air quotes here that you can't see, but background exposures is also going to be really important because you're, you're really talking about nutrition here. So when you engage with a mom who's trying to figure out how to feed her baby, it's not just chemicals that come into play. It's a whole nutritional conversation. And, and most environmental scientists that I know are not nutritionists and they're not infant nutritionists. And so, I mean, I always felt like when I was doing the dioxin PCBs work and breast milk work that it, it was absolutely not my place to, to make recommendations regarding how, how someone should feed their infant. Great, thank you very much for that. So Aaron, you've been patiently waiting. Uh, please proceed with your question. Yes, um, thank you. That was fabulous. And I always um, really rely on the PACU's recommendations. Um, you know, where I work with uh, Dr. Nick Newman um, at Cincinnati Children's, he's fantastic. Um, so I'd love to hear your thought or your insight and expertise you've communicated uh, recommendations to patients. And I'd love to hear what their response was. What was their reaction to, to these recommendations? How did they, how did they take it? Where, was it like, okay, or did, um, did they have other, other questions? Because part of our group's um, goal is to create recommendations, but I'd love to hear what their response has already been like so we can better frame ours. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it can be a wide range of responses. Um, I think sometimes people are very appreciative and um, 
really happy to hear the information and it's a pretty simple conversation and they hadn't heard any of that information before. And then uh, at the other end of the spectrum, people are really frustrated and they feel like there's, you know, there's no way that they're going to be able to actually reduce risk for their kids and that this isn't fair and why why does the burden have to be put on them? Um, so I think you really hear that kind of wide range of exposure um, um, responses um, to, to that uh, kind of guidance. And so it, I, I hear kind of, I hear it all, I guess I would say. And also the level of um, education and knowledge base that people have is very different. Um, you know, some people, have read more articles than I have, and they they will send me articles. Um, and other people really don't um, have any sense of what's happening. They just kind of have general questions. Um, I shouldn't say any sense of what's happening. They just haven't read specifically about certain chemicals. Excellent, thank you. M may I share the community side of that, if that's okay? So I've spoken to many women in my community who have high levels of PFAS in their blood and then struggle with the decision, should I breastfeed my baby? I think women feel um, guilt. You know, I think they really struggle with that decision. I've spoken to women who didn't have informed information from their providers and then did breastfeed their child and then have their child tested and their child has higher levels of PFAS in their blood than the mom did. Um, and so again, um, you know, it's going to be a spectrum of people, but keep in mind, this is a very difficult decision. Women are going to grapple with guilt. They're going to grapple with making the right decision. And what's important from the community side is that all of the information is presented to them and it can be an individual decision. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ned Kalange. Yeah, um, Sheila, this is just a, a little bit of a follow-up uh, on the same issue that you and Andy just spoke of. I wonder to what degree um, the advice that you might provide isn't, um, isn't consistently repeated or supported by the, the child or the mother's primary care provider. So, so in other words, there's the issue about having an expert tell you something, uh, and there is often a, a trusted relationship, especially with pediatricians. Um, that if, if my pediatrician said, don't worry about what you know, the specialist said, I, I'm not that worried about PFOS. And, and that kind of lack of consistency, which I know is out there, right? It's just something I think that kind of undercuts the message. And have you found that or you suspect that, that that's true as well? Yes, um, and, and even in my own setting, you know, um, like a, a good example is I had a provider, um, a general pediatrician say, oh, this family was citing the environmental working groups, personal care products um, assessment and their toxics um, risk assessment. And I, I just thought that it was like not even meaningful, not worthwhile. And the amount of education, you know, that I had to do to explain how they they go through their risk assessment um, to create their recommendations was significant. So it definitely happens. Um, it happens at all levels and it's extremely frustrating. Um, I think on both sides for, for the families to get inconsistent messages, um, but also on the provider side. Um, so we do spend a lot of time doing education, but it, it's really difficult because it's not, it's just not in the medical school curriculum and you know, I've been asked to do like grand rounds at our um, children's hospital. And one of the things that I think about is, well, what should I do grand rounds on? You know, there's this huge range of what we need to talk to providers about. And so what should the focus be? Um, it is not a small topic or small area and every single set of chemicals kind of has different considerations. So um, that does happen. What I to answer you specifically to your question um, directly to your question, I I usually call the provider and talk with them directly um, and try to educate them in the process of doing um, counseling with the family. But as you might imagine, there's hundreds, thousands of providers across the country, so you can only um, 
achieve so much with that method. Thank you. I had a, a question for Dr. Lakind, actually. Um, and you've, you know, studied many chemicals over your career. And we've talked today, uh, more so in the first session, but of some of the challenges associated with PFOS, the number of chemicals in the class, um, the biopersistence in the environment, the long serum half-life, all these challenges to, to studying, um, you know, the, the contributions and the pathways. And I was just wondering, you know, um, how you approach this challenge. Are there parallels in other work, but how are we to, to move forward amidst, you know, um, some of those issues? Yeah, yeah, that's a really great question. I, and, and I don't envy the task you have, you know, in front of you, but I think, um, I think there's a short term and a longer term way of thinking about these kinds of problems. And the short term is, is maybe the hardest one because people always want answers. I mean, I want answers and so oftentimes they just aren't going to be there. And I think it's really important to acknowledge uncertainty. Um, I think deciding on the level of uncertainty you're willing to accept in order to have the information serve as the foundation for a recommendation is going to be really important. You know, how confident, how much data does the committee think they really need to make a recommendation? How confident do they have to be in that data? And how can they share the uncertainties with, with the communities and the clinicians and ATSDR and, and other interested parties? I, I think that's got to be all part of the conversation. I think in the longer term, one of the frustrations I know that I had in looking at the intervention literature for, for the committee is that we're not nobody is surprised that this is an issue at this point. We didn't, we didn't find out yesterday that these chemicals are pervasive in, in the U.S. citizenry and around the, the globe. And so the fact that there isn't a really strong research program going on right now with testing and biomonitoring and environmental testing is, to me, at least, astonishing. And so um, I think that's the, that's the longer term goal of how can you collect the information that you need to make sure that the advice that you're giving now is, is really going to hold up. And, and, you know, like one really quick example is Sheila mentioned not tracking Dustin, which I think generally is a great suggestion. But for PFAS, there's one paper that we found and they looked at people tracking in dust from outside and found that it didn't seem to be the thing that was driving dust concentrations. And people will see that literature and they'll, and they'll try to reconcile the literature with the recommendations that they're getting. So um, I'm not sure if, that's answer, if I answered your question, but I, I, I do think that you need to, or it would be helpful. I think we all need to be thinking about short-term response and, and long-term response. Great, thank you very much for answering that. Any other questions from the committee? That's the obligatory three seconds of silence. And I know we have time on the clock, but we're also a little over, I think, too. So I think this is a good point to uh, wrap up this um, session. And I'd just like to thank uh, all the panelists and uh, once more uh, for a great uh, discussion and great presentation and to the committee members for their questions. And I will hand it back uh, to Nick Kalash. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. And I want to uh underscore uh, what a useful session this has been and listening to folks. Um, this has been very helpful to the committee in our deliberations moving forward. So I really appreciate your time today.